Okay, hello everyone. We are live. Um, we are so glad that you are all able to join us today for our Women in Product and UX Design event. This has been a long anticipated event um, since we did our 2021 State of Design event. The feedback and demand for a panel around women in design was huge. So we are so happy to be able to deliver that to you today. For those of you who might be new here, just a little background on who I am and who Tech Emotion is. Um, my name is Emma Jordan. I am a marketing manager at staffing and recruiting firm Motion Recruitment, who is the founder and sponsor of Tech Emotion Events. Tech in Motion is our international tech event series, and we were founded with the goal of bringing together the tech community from all over to share ideas and to inspire one another. So let's get into today's topic and agenda so you all know what, what to expect, what's about to happen, and then we can go ahead and get straight into the discussion. So today you have the opportunity to hear from an all-star panel of really, truly amazing women in design about their personal career stories and their best advice for you. So whether you are just getting started in design, um, looking to make a career transition, wherever you might be leveling up your career, um, this conversation is for you. And we have women from all different places in their own careers who can share just invaluable advice. Um, so yeah, I hope you are all so excited. That being said, please drop your questions in the Q&A box throughout the discussion. This is truly your chance to get your questions answered. I know quite a few of you have submitted questions prior when you were registering, so we've made sure to include that in our uh, plans for our discussion today. Um, but go ahead and ask live questions as well, and we'll incorporate those too. Today's webinar will also be available on demand after the live session ends. You'll receive a link via email to view the video, so if you have to hop out for any reason, no worries. Last but not least, don't forget to follow us on social so that you can be in the know of all of the upcoming events and opportunities and ways that we have for you to be able to get involved. So let's get into the reason you are actually all here today. Um, without further ado, I'm so happy to introduce to you our moderator for today, Emanuela Demiani. Um, you can go ahead and take it from here and I'll see you guys at the end. Thank you so much, Emma. So hi everyone, my name is Emanuela Damiani and I work as a UX manager for Mozilla Firefox. And I'm super excited to be here today with you. Uh, if my accent is a bit weird, it's because I'm actually an Italian living in Berlin. So it's actually dark right now for me. And, but you know, like I started being UX, I would say like more than 10 years ago, Back then, wasn't, UX wasn't really the name. This field changed their name a lot during the year. Um, maybe some, some of us will remember that. Uh, but yeah, but the way that I start, I would say that everything started because I was lucky that, um, you know, I had a computer and I was able to install Photoshop uh, in it. And I just started and I kind of fall in love with, with the web and with design. And this is how, you know, I start my career here. So I really want to ask uh, my fabulous panelists today if they can quickly introduce themselves and you know, tell me and tell all of you, how did you get started into UX um, and UI? So um, Rory, do you want to go first? Sure, I'm happy to go first. Welcome everybody. Thank you for um, being here today with us. Um, it's, you know, it's very important that we create spaces for women to come together and have these conversations. So I think this is a great, great panel and I'm glad you're all here. Um, I started my career a, a very long time ago. <laughs> um, so I graduated from school with a degree in business and marketing and I actually ended up going to work for a accounting firm. Um, so I was acting as an auditor, a risk auditor, believe it or not. And then from there, you know, at the time I was very junior, right? So I just had graduated from college. So I was working more as a business analyst, um, which I think is a great, is a great stepping stone. It's a great foundation for your career because you, you learn a lot about business process and, um, you know, software integration. And then from there, I went to work for um, a company called Razorfish, which this is in the very, very early days of the internet. Um, and believe it or not, at the time, clients were asking if some of us might remember the idea of having a splash page. So everybody wanted a splash page on their website and um, you know, clients were spending hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for UX and UI at the time. 
And then, um, you know, we had an economy uh, issue and I was laid off at that time. Um, that was the first time I was laid off. And I can remember thinking, um, you know, taking it personally and, and being so upset because I was, I was really excited about what I was doing. Um, but then, you know, I just slowly kind of started working in, in consulting and getting more and more experience um, in the space of information architecture and UX. And then from there, you know, I went over to uh, the client side and I've been there ever since, um, you know, working in this field. So uh, very excited to be here today and I'm going to hand it off to Frankie and she can take over next. Sure. Thanks, Rory, for that one. Hi, everyone. Super excited to be here today and to get into this discussion. Um, I think it's a really important one. So really can't wait to start. But just some background on myself. So I'm currently a UX uh, contract designer at Frontier Tel uh, Communications. Um, but for me, my career mostly started from a graph design standpoint. I went to school, well, originally with the idea of going to become an engineer, fell in love with this idea of coding um, and being able to solve a problem through that medium. But ultimately, I got to college, realized my brain is more oriented for design and not math and coding. Um, and so I quickly switched over to design after my first semester um, and realized that, that I could still solve problems and still create things. It was just through more of that kind of design lens instead. Um, and for me, as much as I love design and I still do, um, for graph design in my classes, I felt like I was missing a lot of the kind of reasoning behind why I was making the design decisions I was making. I could never really confidently say, well, I did this because X, Y, Z. Um, and that's what ultimately got me excited about UX UI design because it really added that extra piece. It allowed me to now say, well, I made this design decision because I did a usability test and saw my users reacted in this manner. Um, you know, fill in those dots, whatever that means based on that scenario. But it really got me more confident in why I was making the design decisions I was doing. Um, and since then, I've kind of jumped around mostly doing a lot of freelance and contract work, um, starting my career at a startup, moving into a design agency, then Adobe, and now Frontier. So jumped around to really kind of see what I like the best, but it's been great, especially during COVID, to kind of join a lot of different teams and network a lot. Um, and for me, the other piece of my career that I love is doing things like this to be able to give back and help break that barrier of entry. Um, because as, as you saw, I didn't do that that long ago. So I've also joined kind of the content uh, creation lens as well, doing a lot of that through Instagram and LinkedIn posts, being able to try and help and provide tips and tricks for really what I've learned along my career. So that's the other piece of it, but really, as Rory said, excited and everyone else to get into this. So I will pass it over to Kristen. Hello everyone, I am Kristen Arakalian. I am a digital design program coach with CVS Health and Aetna. Um, and I am really excited to be here today and share my story with you and hope it provides some inspiration if you are looking to get into the field of user experience. Uh, my current role blends to traditional responsibilities of a Scrum Master and Agile coach to help satisfy the needs of creative team members. I really enjoy what I do, um, but it wasn't a direct line. I found my way over to UX. I didn't start here. I spent the first part of my career in legal research and writing. I took some time off to raise my family and uh, doing small jobs, editing reviews, profile vetting, and a colleague in front of mine, I was a UX lead for an education company and asked if I would help her with research projects. And I hesitated at first and then I jumped in. <laughs> And it was a great decision. Um, I began working and uh, supporting UX research on large research initiatives, and I was eventually hired by the company. I continue to focus my energy and learnings in the current job market and in tech. I combined UX research process improvements in my organizational skill set to the design team and in eventually into design integration and safe and scrum practices. Um, I, so the way I look at it, I took what I enjoyed doing, which was research and working with teams and blended that with my skill set of self-organizing and helping teams do that. Um, with further commitment and wonderful colleagues that invested in my growth, I advanced and to shape my career path to what I have today. So I 
am happy to turn it over to Dipali. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm very passionate about, you know, helping others grow in their career and helping to guide them in their career. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, my story is kind of similar to Frankie's actually. Um, I actually studied graphic design in college. And when I graduated, I actually began as a print designer. So I was designing credit card statements and bank statements that had very dense information in them. And I had to organize the information and present it in a very digestible manner. And as this was happening, like the internet boom was just going crazy. So I got very interested in the digital world and I was able to transfer my information design skills into information architecture. So that's how I made the transition from print to digital. And since then, I've worked in you know, many different industries like advertising, publishing, finance, and I just learned everything on the job, you know, from mm -hmm. user research, usability testing, persona development. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't take any classes. I just absorbed everything that I saw at work. And I just love UX because even though I have a degree in graphic design and I enjoy the visual aspect of it, I really, really enjoy doing the thinking part of it and being able to set the vision for an experience. So that's why I'm sticking with UX. Um, I also, you know, just kind of became a leader in the industry and started to create in-house UX teams. And I did that for a while and it was very challenging, but I also missed the day-to-day -day design work. So currently I'm actually freelancing at Verizon and I'm doing you know, hands-on design work, which I find very satisfying. So thank you. No, thank you so much. And you know what, I really want to dig maybe a bit later today into the idea of how, you know, how we started right now, but how people can start today. Like, you know, um, as you say, like you learn a lot on the job and I felt, I feel the same, right? I feel that, that I learned a lot on the job too. And maybe this can be a question for later, like, or you know what, let's ask it now. Like, do you think we can, do you think it's still possible? I'm asking this because, you know, even just looking at some questions that are coming from the audience, like there have been people that maybe they completed their bootcamp and now they're unable to land in the full-time job, right? Or they're career switching and they're looking into joining a course. So how do you do it today? And this is a question that, you know, also as a UX manager and as part of various UX community, I've been asked a lot. And my answer is usually, you know, I think I think doing maybe one of those boot camp is great, but there is also, you need to understand that the field of UX is very uh, vast and large, right? You can decide which part of UX you want to specialize. And sometimes mm -hmm. those boot camp are just giving you a sort of, uh, you know, interaction, right? Uh, UX 101. Uh, but then it's up to you to understand where do you want to go? Who helps us, you know, different opinion and experience? Oh, Frankie, go ahead. I want to jump in because I'm actually a boot camp grad myself. I realized I did not mention that in my intro. So throwing that out there. So as a boot camp grad myself, I'm all for boot camps. I do think they are a great starting place to your point. But I think that especially because of COVID and the fact that this is a newer industry, and I think within you know the last year and a half, give or take, there's been a huge influx into this field. Um, I think that just doing a boot camp is not enough anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been seeing this with my mentees and with a, a lot of individuals who are trying to break in. And I think that it's a great place to start, but I don't think it's the be all end all. I think that mm -hmm. the best way to kind of take that plunge further is once you've kind of gotten the basic understandings and the principles and the skill sets, it's how do you practice that? How do you differentiate yourself um, and get more views and ways of being seen? Um, and so I think the best way first off is 
trying to get some quote unquote real world projects. Um, you know, mm -hmm. these don't need to be with the biggest companies. They don't need to be long projects at all. They can be, you know, a week long, two weeks, a month, whatever you can physically make possible. But I think like reach out to friends and family, reach out mm -hmm. to their own networks and try and get yourself a project where it's a company who needs a redesign of their website. You know, they haven't been updated in a couple of years or it's a company who's new and needs um, a website or a mobile app or a company that just is much older and never went into the digital space. Um, there's lots of opportunities to do it that way. That's how I started right out of my boot camp. Um, and I think it a gave me a great way to have projects from my portfolio that weren't boot camp only, but it also gave me that experience to kind of see what I would learn kind of moving forward in the, my career as I was working with more clients, working with more stakeholders. Um, it really just kind of gave me a lot of opportunities to kind of really see what I'd be experiencing. So definitely just try and get as much under your belt as possible through your own networks, I would say. Mm -hmm. Great point, Frankie. Um, anybody else wants to contribute to this? I, I do think, you know, looking at your community is important, right? Mm -hmm. So small businesses, small, you know, even specifically small women run businesses mm -hmm. typically are looking for some help on just even, you know, a brochure where a couple of screens, but it's an, it's somewhere to get you started of looking at content, looking at marketing and UX all together and how it all comes together. Um, also, nonprofits is another area mm -hmm. where you can look to to you know use your skills, um, and and again you know kind of just reaching into your network using LinkedIn, all of those things. I think you, you know when they come together, you can find something that will give you that experience experience for sure. No, I agree, Rory. Um, I think it does help to set the intention of what you're looking to do and be curious and willing to know more. I think UX encourages exploration and has many offerings within. I think about the connections you are making and what you have, and I encourage attending events or joining relevant associations such as UXBA. Uh, think about what your strengths are and uh, what you enjoy doing and how you can best apply that to enhance your current skill set. Sometimes it's not always a direct line. Sometimes it can work for you if you take an internship, which may not be highly desirable initially, but it will get you in the door. Yeah, yeah I mean, I agree with that, you know, just use your network as much as possible. Um, yeah. If you have like a favorite professor or, you know, a mentor of some sort, definitely ask for their help. Also, you know, don't be afraid to just go to a company website and look at their mm -hmm. job postings also. Um, I know a lot of people often say, oh, it just goes into a black hole, but you know, mm -hmm. there have been a lot of times where I've gotten responses. So that's mm -hmm. another way to go as well. And like a really interesting to this idea also like on mentorship, right? Um, this was something that unfortunately I didn't have one for a really long time at the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. um, but there is also, you know, I think that a mentor is something that you can have every time in your career. Mm -hmm. There is somehow this idea that you only need a mentor when you're starting, but you actually need a mentor for your own, uh, you know, mm -hmm. your own life. It's just great to have somebody who can advise you and give you some perspective. Um, and I know that... Uh, Dipali, like you have some, um, you know, ideas about mentorship, right? Yeah, um, it's hard. It's hard to find a mentor <laughs> and it's a process. Um, you have to have an idea of what kind of characteristics you're looking for in a person. Uh, for me, you know, I'm an introvert, so I need to be able to feel very comfortable with that person and be mm -hmm. able to trust them a thousand percent. And also I need to know that they're willing to spend the time to guide me. Mm -hmm. um, I can honestly say I didn't really have a true mentor until about like seven years ago. I had people that I would go to for advice here and there, but no one on a consistent basis. Um, but now mm -hmm. I do. And mm -hmm. I always talk to my mentor about you know, how to handle certain situations, what I should do next in my career. 
In fact, she's the one who recommended me for this panel. So mm -hmm. I know that she's always looking out for me. Um, mm -hmm. The other piece of advice I would give you is, and this is something I'm trying to do myself, is kind of create a board of directors for yourself, mm -hmm. meaning get a group of people from different disciplines and different areas. They don't all have to be from UX. Like my mentor is actually in marketing and branding. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's great to have a set group of people with diverse perspectives who can give you different advice. Um, so getting together a board of directors would be my advice. Definitely worth it. Can I jump in here? Yeah. Um, I have two sides of this or two pieces to add. The first is mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with probably everything you just said. I also do want to call out that I don't think mentorship needs to necessarily be a formalized thing. Um, you know, I have people who I don't necessarily call to their face my mentor. I don't really call them that at all to anyone, but they're definitely someone, if I have a question, I'm, they're one of the first people I'm always going to think to, to go ask them about kind of, you know, about an interview process or about a skill set, whatever it is involving kind of my generalized career. I always mm -hmm. go to them, but I don't really call them that. So I think that's mm -hmm. the first thing to think about is like, look around in your network and see who are those people, you know, can you maybe formalize it a bit more if you wanted that and have that conversation with them? Or, you know, are you okay just kind of keeping it as this kind of casual thing that you know that you have their support and they're there, even if they aren't necessarily a mentor. Um, the other piece to it is, and I've seen that this keeps popping up in the chat, but I definitely want to call it out. And I will say I am biased. I am a mentor on that platform, but ADP list is a great place. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of it, it's a website where you can kind of just go on and schedule a call, whether for coffee chat, portfolio review, um, you want to learn about their company, really any type of conversation. Um, we all kind of call out what our specialties are. Um, and it's a great way to avoid that awkward dance of trying to find someone who wants to be a mentor. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll find someone you have questions, but they may not answer back or something like that. So, you know, at least this way, they're opening their schedule for this uh, specific aspect. So definitely take a look. There's people from all stages in their career from just starting or just, excuse me, just finishing a boot camp to been in their career in this industry for many, many years. So definitely take a look there. Um, as I said, quite biased, but I think it's a great resource. I actually started as a mentee um, and switched over. So it works. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And I mean, I'm seeing also a lot of conversation in the chat about like uh, mentorship and how to find a good mentor. So I'm glad that we uh, touch on this topic and it's like really, really important. Just want to say that even, you know, like connect with one of us, on LinkedIn, right? If we're saying mm -hmm. something that you find interesting, connect with one of us. I'm pretty sure, and I'm sorry if I'm volunteering all of you, but like I'm pretty sure we're we're all going to be happy to, you know, to reply yeah. to your questions like more specifically here. Um, so I want to, you know, we're we're still, you know, in my mind at the beginning, right? So what kind of advice you will give to of somebody, in particular, someone who identify themselves as a woman, right, to start their career in product and UX design. Um, Kristen, do you have an idea? Yes, I would say if you're looking as a woman to start in UX, I would say to understand what is important to you, uh, what you would like to learn. And as I said before, be curious Yes, and, and willing to know more and explore what interests you and be honest with yourself about where you would like to focus. Would you like to work in healthcare? Would you like to work in finance, education, a startup? And then target the specific area of interest to you in discovery, research, design, or project management. And I'd also encourage you to look at several course selections from various organizations or schools, General Assembly, Bentley University, I'm not making a plug, it's just, I know that they have really good programs and offerings where you can explore course descriptions and what interests you and where you can apply your current skill set and, and help grow. Uh, there's also free courses on LinkedIn that you can take to learn more at MITx um, for more information about certain disciplines and subject matters that may be of interest to you. 
I think it's really helpful to get as much information as you can and, and where you think you would like to focus and then set your intention further from there. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Um, anyone, anybody else has some, you know, advice on how to start? So we I mentioned already a lot of things. I'm sorry, Rory. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> I, was just, I was just gonna say, you know, we, we talked earlier about sort of the vastness of, mm -hmm. of this discipline, right? So, and thinking that you're going to be able to, um, you know, find deep expertise in all the areas is I, th I think a little um, lofty of a goal because mm -hmm. there is just so much to understand, right? So under figuring out, do I wanna focus on research? Do I want to focus more on UX as a discipline in terms of information architecture, use case journey, um, you know, journey mapping, persona mapping, all of that? Am I more focused on the visual design, the UI piece of it? They all come together and merge, but, you know, for most, at least, you know, from what I've seen from the people that are on my team and that I work with, they, there's a, there tends to be an area that, that folks focus in on more, right? Mm -hmm. Just so they can have like deep knowledge in one, one specific area. So I think it's understanding what all of those, um, you know, all of those disciplines within UX, UI encompass, mm -hmm. and then, you know, doing the certifications and the research and the learning that Kristen just talked about within, within those, those disciplines, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'd also add on top of that, that once you've kind of got into that point of figuring out, okay, this is kind of where I want to see myself, you know, this is the industry I want to do within UX or what I want to do within UI, et cetera, to Rory's point. I would also then say, like, don't be afraid to apply to applications. Um, mm -hmm. I've noticed this, like, there's a lot of um, uh, articles out there on this, and I don't remember the exact stats, so I apologize, but it, there's a stat out there that basically says men are more likely to apply to a job when they have, mm -hmm. you know, less of the requirements that are being asked for, and they kind of just go for it and are like, you know what, whatever, I'll try, let's hope for it where women mm -hmm. uh, statistically are more likely to be like, oh, I don't have, you know, 90% of the qualifications. I'm just not going to apply. Let me go find that the job that I actually am fully qualified for. Um, you know, I will admit I've applied for jobs in one of my positions I've had wanted more years of experience than I actually had at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but I still got it and I kept extending my contract with them. So, you know, I'm walking proof that it doesn't necessarily always need to be every single requirement. So, you know, don't be afraid if you have, I say about 80% of the qualifications that are being asked for, you know, take a stab at it because you just really mm -hmm. never know what's going to happen and what they're looking yeah. for uh, in that exact moment. Yes. Let me add something to that because I also, uh, I think that one of the best secret kept in our industry is that, that the, knowing how to do an interview is actually a yes. skill. Like mm -hmm. you need to practice. This is why I think your advice, yes. Frankie, is so good. Like, Yes. Go apply to company, apply to company that you don't like, right? You go there yes. <laughs> and you learn how to do it. Um, and in the end, you may end up learning that some questions are kind of always the same. Um, in our Q&A section, there is something related to red flags. You start to recognize those red flags if you start to interview more and more often. So it is really a skill. This is also something that maybe, you know, a lot of community can help you out to do this kind of fake interview where you just exercise. Uh, but it's so important, like thinking of that as something, as a muscle that you need to exercise, even when you have a stable job, like this is always a good muscle to, you know, keep, um, keep in motion. Uh, Kristen, you seem really, um, you seem to agree with me a lot here. <laughs> I do, I do. I, I think that's, it is really important how you present yourself and, and going into a job interview informed. I, I think that is, it's something that I do think requires more attention and preparation for than I think is actually allowed or given. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's, um, that's great. And FYI, like, 
when I apply for this position, like for my previous position at Mozilla, I actually applied just because I liked the company and I was just excited. It's like, maybe I can meet some designers that work on something cool. And then I got a job. So like, you never know uh, when, when, you know, you're apply just for learn something and when you're applying for, and you actually discover something great for yourself. Um, so moving a bit out from the getting started phase and going a bit into more like leveling up um, your career. Here we all have different type of experience, right? Um, but what do you think are, you know, the skills that we actually need? We just said that maybe one of the skills is knowing how to interview for the position that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, what are other skills that we may need? I would say, um... One thing that's always helped me is just to follow your gut instinct. I think um, women by nature have great intuition and great instincts. And, you know, there have been a few times in my career where I've voiced my opinions on a project, but the team decides to go in a different direction. And then when we present it to the client, it falls flat and the client brings up the same points that I was bringing up earlier. And so yes, it was frustrating at first, but it was also really satisfying to know that my instincts were in line with the client. So mm -hmm. my advice is follow your gut. Yeah, and I would say also, you know, as women, we tend to, um, we tend to inherently create the self-doubt of, mm -hmm. of what our perspective is or what our opinion is before we've even said anything, <laughs> before we've even put, put our thoughts out there, right? So we're, we're already, um, you know, I don't, I don't wanna use the word putting ourselves down, but in many ways in our mind, mentally, that's what we are doing, right? So I think it's important that you find, you know, you have the data, right? So I, mm -hmm. I always talking to my team about the data, right? You have the data, you have the research to support your recommendations. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you pull it all together and you have a cohesive story to present to your client, your stakeholder, then, you know, you've, you've done your job of presenting the best recommendation given, you know, the data and the information that you have and your experience. So, just feeling confident in that. And mm -hmm. like Dipali said, they may not always go with what you, what the recommendation you're making, but you at least can be confident in the story and the proposal that you're making. So I think, you know, again, it's, it's, I always go back to the data, right? The research, have we talked to customers? Do we have any, you know, A-B testing? Have we done um, competitive analysis? Like that piece of it is so critical to us being able to be confident in what our um, proposal is. The first thing I was gonna say is exactly just that, always use the data. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks for mentioning that. The other thing I would say is also is, well, I had a second point, it just disappeared out of my brain. Um, hold on, give me one second and I'll come back. Um, but being, oh, being able to make sure that you're solving for the right problem, I think is also yes. a major skill set and something that, mm -hmm you know, I've definitely learned along my career and I've, I'm still practicing. And I think it's something we're all, you know, continuously work on, but, you know, I think it's very easy to say, okay, this is the problem at hand right off the bat. Um, just mm -hmm. from, you know, doing little data or from your own experiences and being biased with the circumstance. Um, and I think the most important thing is really being able to make sure that that really is the major problem that's causing all this. So when I was in my boot camp, one thing that I was actually taught that, you know, still sticks with me is this image of a little like five-year-old kid or something like that, like a little kid, basically, who's going to their parents and annoyingly asking a hundred times why, you know, asking them just constantly, why can't I do this? Why this? Why that? Um, obviously that gets very irritating for those of you who are parents. I'm sure you are aware of that. Um, and I'm not saying that you should go and annoy your teammates, annoy your clients by any means, but just in the back of your head, always remembering that kind of example of the reason the kid keeps asking is he wants to know the real reason why. So, you know, why can't I have ice cream? 
oh, you need to eat your vegetables. Well, why do I need to eat my vegetables? You know, it keeps going and going until you get to the point of, well, you want to be healthy. Um, you know, and you can keep taking that down further and further. But my point being is make sure that you're just constantly questioning why you're doing something and why you're solving for that problem in mind. Um, and I think that will always get you to that real major issue that will solve the bigger problem. Yes, I agree, Frankie. Um, I, I think it is worth noting, I, I completely agree with the preparedness of, of your data and your metrics, and also being judged on your presentation and how you come forth. So be authentic with yourself and others. Just be yourself and get very comfortable being yourself um, with other people and in your interactions. Uh, found being prepared is also learning to choose your words and choose your words wisely and uh, remain empathetic in your listening as well. And I try not to make a judgment until I'm hearing the other person's point of view. And I want to value that because I, I need to hear that to understand what they need from me. And uh, be honest with yourself and others, even when it's a hard conversation. It, the benefit is building trust and respect. And that has worked for me. This is all beautiful. I will say that probably the, the major skill that I'm looking into any kind of designer, uh, mm -hmm. you can be like a UI designer, a content designer, um, whatever role you're apply for in the UX design uh, realm is the ability to understand what, like the context, like your ability to understand the context, because once you have this ability of understanding what is more fitting for that specific context, you're actually able to make I don't want to say to make the right decision, right? But to at least to start to ask the right questions to people um, and to not make too many assumptions. Assumptions are part of our job. And, you know, in and going back for me to the difference between a boot camp and like real life is that sometimes in real life, we need to go a bit with our assumption. We need to go a bit with our gut. We need, of course, to talk with our team, with our product manager, with our I don't know, marketing team and say like, okay, let's be really clear here. We're making a huge assumption how we're going to manage the risk around this. Uh, but having this ability, which is something that you need to develop with time and you always need to exercise as well to understand what fits the right context is like number one. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, you know, something that also the audience was asking, like, how do you all keep up to date with what's happening in the field? How do you keep your um, skills fresh? For me, I'm constantly reading articles on Medium. I'm constantly on Instagram. Um, I know that may sound crazy to some of you. Um, I think Instagram is a great place for education. Um, the reason I say that is specifically I'm talking within kind of the design UX space. Um, I think there's a ton of individuals like myself, you know, not to self-promote here, but there's a ton of us out there who are posting a lot of educational resources to explain top skill sets that are in the moment that you need to learn or trends that are actively uh, being used a lot of the time at the moment. And so it's a great place that are just quick little tidbits to kind of get a quick glimpse into what some of the designers in the field are thinking are important at the moment. Um, as well as when I have the time, it doesn't always work, but when I have some downtime, I also like to try and do some kind of like mini case studies for myself, um, either ones for um, like a meetup project that I've kind of come up with in my head, or I recently did one for a redesign of the LinkedIn app. Um, it's an app I spend way too much time on. Um, if anyone knows me, it's the first thing I do before I go to bed and the first thing I do in the morning. Um, and it's one of those things where I hadn't used Figma in a while, so I wanted to go back into it. So I decided, let me do a project. Um, and it was somewhere where I had a lot of my own personal pain points. So I was curious to kind of see and just get back into the swing of things with a project I was interested in. So it's another way to kind of get a small little project on your portfolio as well. Um, I have like two sections. I have client work and then playground. Um, so it's a way where I can just kind of show like not a full-blown case study. It took me one and a half to two days, give or take. Um, and I just kind of sat down and played with it. So just really coming up with projects or just looking on resources. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. 
-hmm. Yeah, personally for me, um, conferences and like mm -hmm. events like the, the one of tonight is a great way to, um, you know, keep myself always up to date and uh, just understand who is part of the community. As Frankie would say, like create your network, follow people that you uh, find or say um, interesting uh, things. And a lot of time, what you actually need to learn during your career, or at least it's my experience, are actually not super, like skills that are not super related to UX, but more the skills that are related to the domain that you're actually mm -hmm. working on mm -hmm. at that time. So you may end up as a UXer to be, I don't know, specialized in legal because you're working with a lot of, uh, I don't know, legal studio and you're helping them. So you, you may end up being a ethical designer working a lot into that space. So this is, this is also why I found like a really beautiful our field and I also allow a lot of possibility and people are transitioning from different background um, as well. Like speaking of different um, background, right? I would like to ask um, maybe um, you, um, Pipali, like how do you think we can better address the problem of diversity and inclusion in our product, but I will also say in our team, in our mm -hmm. UX and product team? Yeah, um, well, one thing for products, um, when you're doing usability testing, for example, I think it's really important to get, you know, participants from all different types of backgrounds and mm -hmm. perspectives and, you know, not just stick to the persona that you're trying to design for, but, you know, get a little bit broader than that. So I think that's one way to get some diversity into your actual product. Um, in terms of just in your team, I think it's just really important to be open, you know, mm -hmm. just be open on to everyone on your team. You know, it's made up of different people from all different backgrounds. And I don't think anyone should be silenced because of a preconceived notion of who they are and where they come from. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I would just say be open to all different perspectives and opinions. You may not agree with them, but it's still good to hear them. Right, and I, you know, to that point, um, it's it's also looking at the company, right? So, um, mm -hmm. what is the company's culture around this, mm -hmm. and how does the company represent themselves in this area? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what do the teams look like? I, I know. For me, you know, my team is is very diverse, and mm -hmm. that helps us because everybody is coming to the table with their own perspective, their own lens, right? The the viewpoint mm -hmm. from their world. So it helps to you're just going to end up building a better product that way. So I think that's an important point when you're interviewing at companies to mm -hmm. really try to get a sense as to um, you know what what does that look like at this company. Um, and in asking some hard questions, there's, there's no reason to feel like you can't ask those hard questions. Um, because, you know, I think it's important for us to remember that they're interviewing you, but you are also interviewing them, right? Um, and that's a very important point. I think sometimes we go in and again, um, it's the, it's the self-doubt monster <laughs> in the head, right? You know, um, and, and just remembering that you're coming to the table with, with a skill set and experience and, and to be proud of that, right? So I think that's an important point. Yes, I agree, Rory. Um, it helps to think globally. And, and think think bigger and invest time into understanding the nuances and complexities of the product, product line of the company that you're currently working with and understand the target market too and understand what's you know current and innovative solutions. I know for um, inclusion in products, A11Y inclusion and nuances requires more subject matter expertise. So it does help to invest um, in understanding more about 
that space. And if you have questions to ask, there are plenty of there's plenty of information on this and folks willing to help and guide a process if you need one. Um, there's new initiatives or they can direct you to sustainable solutions as well. Um, I've found fostering relationships and partnering with A11 White organizations has been incredibly helpful and valuable to me in my current position. To Kristen's point there, I just want to throw out a resource. Um, definitely, it's a kind of high level beginning start. Um, but if you want to mm -hmm. learn more about kind of the thought process behind designing for like inclusive uh, products, Mismatch mm -hmm. by, I'm gonna, is it Cat Holmes? Yeah, by Cat Holmes um, is a great yep. place to start. Um, it's a pretty easy book to read, um, but I can throw the, the link in the chat as well, but wanted to throw that out there. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Frankie. And like in your experience, Okay, let's do like a sort of really quick yes or no question. Um, I mean, it's not really yes or no, but like how many times did you have um, like a boss that was another woman in your career, more or less? What was the question? How many times have I had a, another woman? Yeah, another, another woman as, you know, your manager. I, yeah, like let's say your direct manager. Mm -hmm. Once. Uh, it's been about once. five. I've actually had a few. Yeah. My current manager is actually a woman. Mm -hmm. And she's fantastic. Like, did you find any difference? Because I I really, you know, I really felt that um, I only had two times um, a woman as a manager. And I honestly have felt a bit different about the things that we can talk in our one-on-one -on -one and like somehow she had a better understanding of some of the issue that, you know, we may all have and let's, we want to talk about that. Like, let's talk about imposter syndrome, right? We all had, had imposter syndrome at a certain point or maybe we still have it. I have it a bit right now I've been your moderator today because you're all fantastic. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not that great. Uh, but yeah, like, so how do you overcome or try, you know, to shoot, to ash this inner voice? Mm -hmm. I can jump in. It's definitely something I faced a lot at the beginning of my career. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of felt like I was thrown into it a little bit to some extent. Um, just for some context, basically I had done my boot camp, and then I started posting a lot of articles about kind of my own projects and kind of my own opinion of UX and like what I had been learning. Um, <clears throat> and because at that point, there wasn't a lot of resources like that out there. I ended up having a lot of like individuals reach out to me on LinkedIn asking to start conversations with me um, and wanted to learn about my career and my journey. And as someone who was so new, didn't felt like I didn't really know what I was doing at that point, I definitely kind of early on faced imposter syndrome. Um, and I remember reaching out to an individual, actually through ADP List, um, and having a chat with him. And it kind of stuck with me what he taught me or what he mentioned to me of like how he goes about it. Um, and it's this idea, <clears throat> sorry, losing my voice. It's this idea that there's always gonna be kind of these larger fish in the industry ahead of you. Um, mm -hmm. Larger in the sense that they're further along in their career, maybe they're more known, whatever that means. Um, and instead of thinking about that in like a terrifying manner, um, try and think of it as a lot more kind of medium fish out there um, who you know aren't as scary per se, and they're gonna be there to always help you. So trying to flip the narrative and thinking about rather than these people just always being intimidating, think about them as resources and ways of like reaching out for help and knowing that, yeah, Yes, there's always people ahead of me and more advanced in their career, mm -hmm. but I can use that to my advantage and get help from them. Um, and, you know, it's still going to be intimidating at times, but it's definitely mm -hmm. helped me try to kind of move forward and think about, you know, how I can get help and how to answer some questions that I'm facing. Um, so for me, that's really been the thing is just like flip the narrative. Absolutely. I, I if you do struggle with it, I, I know I've struggled, struggled with it at certain times and um, take professional coaching often. I know I have, and it really helps. It helps when you get stuck and maybe we don't see it, um, but a professional coach will help draw it out and bring moments of pause to help you answer your own questions. It's been an incredibly valuable um, to me. And 
I also think about being honest about yourself with yourself about what scares you. You know, what is scary and what challenges do you want to admit to yourself and um, take a deep dive into understanding more about why it's scary. The answer and solution will surprise you. Um, and I think being prepared is really important. Know your stuff, know your audience. It's okay to say you don't know or you don't have an answer, but do follow up with one and try not to pull back or overthink. Just jump in and swim. There's room for everyone and you will figure it out. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. And, you know, it's so, it's so true. And I think another topic that maybe we don't talk about that too much in our community, especially for, for women, is the topic of burnout. So this is kind of a personal question, and I'm sorry if I didn't check with you all before, but like, did ever, did any of you ever experience uh, personally uh, burnout at work? I did. Happy to talk about it. Um, yeah, maybe quickly, I actually, thank you, I actually just did recently and took some time off from it to some extent. Um, but I'm a person who I will admit is overly ambitious. Um, I love to do way too many things at once. Um, <clears throat> it's how I've always been. I've always kind of worked on multiple projects. Um, mm -hmm. And I found at first that it was great to kind of hop around from idea to idea, from project to project. Um, but it definitely got to a point where I kind of couldn't say no to projects and would always just jump in and say yes and become overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that I had agreed to. Um, and this is because, you know, I was working full time. I do my content creation on the side, which also turned into a full time job at a point. Um, I'm always mentoring at least once a week. So it just kind of kept adding up and it was choices I wanted to do, but it got to a point where it was too much to handle. Um, and there was really no um, gap between kind of personal life and like doing things for myself and work anymore. Um, and so what I've kind of realized, and this is definitely something I did a lot of self-reflection on recently, is figuring out kind of what can I say no to, but still being able to help break that barrier, still being able to help give back and do the things I want to do, but realizing that, you know, I don't have to do everything. Um, and so learning that there is that balance between, you know, figuring out what you actually want to do and what you're capable and have the time for, um, or things that you can say, look, I want to help you. How can I do it in a, you know, less invasive way in the less intense way, like time consuming way. Um, or, you know, how can I help you maybe down the line once I have more time? Um, so I think it's just trying to figure out kind of where your priorities are and learning to be able to, you know, accept that you can say no. Exactly. I was just going to add on to that. Like, don't be afraid to say no. I think as women, you know, if we're asked to do something, we just automatically do it because we think it's going to help us move forward. You know, um, the more we do, the more promotions we're going to get or something like that. But it's really not going to help you. It's just going to burn you out. So just don't be afraid to say no. And I would add to that, there's, there's a feeling that if we don't do it, that it will somehow impact us in a negative way, right? Yep. And, we will, yep. and, and there, there, is, there is also the dynamic of there's a, a male counterpart that is doing it, right? So mm -hmm. that even becomes even more challenging when you have a family because now you are trying to balance commitments with your children, um, you know, commitments with your house, commitments with your work, and, and having to find a way to handle all that, you have to learn. You won't be able to do it. You have to learn to say no. You have to learn to prioritize your time and you have to learn to delegate. Um, and that's also a difficult, it's a, there, there's a, comes a point in your career where you need to now learn to shift. Oh, you are no longer the owner. You know, you're not an individual contributor anymore. And you have a different role where you're managing a team or you're, you're you know, it could be one person or it could be eight people, but you need to learn to be able to trust in them, to de delegate and, and um, you know, reprioritize your time because you can't, you can't take it all on and be successful, right? So it's just, it's too much. It becomes too much for one person to handle. 
Um, so I think it's important to to understand how to say no elegantly <laughs> um, and and kind of you know work through your the your the ways that you prioritize your time. I do also want to call out that like even if you're just starting your career, like you can still say no. So I'm just over two years and a bit in my career and like I'm learning now the hard way, unfortunately, but I am learning that like I can say no, like I have that authority. Mm -hmm. like, even though I do want to progress my career and there's a lot I want to do and et cetera and kind of grow as a person and in my career and everything within the UX UI space, there still is that balance. So, you know, even those of you just starting out, like definitely still take this to heart. Like take a break, do what you need to do for yourself, for your family. Don't be afraid that, you know, you won't get as far as you want to in your career because that will still happen. Um, so mm -hmm. just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. And often what I've done when I've started a new job is just set boundaries for myself. Like I'm not going to work past like 6.30, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to leave the office. So I think when you set boundaries like that for yourself and people see you doing that, you know, they're not going to pile things onto you either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to this point um, is in terms of COVID. So when I, you know, my, when I first had my first child, she's now going to be 16. I can't believe it. I had to fight for one day to work from home. Right. So I had to, you had to write a proposal. You had to go in front of a committee. HR had to approve it. Everybody had to approve it. That was, was over you. And that was to just get one day to work from home. And now it, because of COVID, it, it has shifted. And, and if there's, you know, there's nothing positive that came out of COVID, but it has changed the way that we work, right? But at the same mm -hmm. time now we're working, I feel like I'm working almost around the clock, right? Especially yeah. because I have a global team. So mm -hmm. it becomes even more important to think about how am I going to, you know, how am I going to save myself some of that time, right? So making those commitments to yourself that Dipali just talked about, what are your boundaries for the day? So I, you know, for me, if it's before 6 a.m., I cannot get on a, on a uh, conference call, right? Because I have mm -hmm. my children and I have to get them ready and everything. So you have to kind of find what are your, what are your boundaries? What are you going to be able to do? Um, so just thinking about that, and, and especially with COVID, it has changed the dynamic uh, quite a bit. 100%. Yeah, and you know, like, let me share this with the audience. I am actually, I'm going to have the baby maybe in two weeks. So my due date is in two weeks. Um, but you know, like the first thing that I realized that when I told to my manager, I was more worried about let them know that I was like, you know, I was expecting rather than being, being happy to share this wonderful news. And I was really grateful that I had like a really, you know, great manager who realized like, hey, wait a second, let's talk later about how we're going to manage your team or how we're going to manage your maternity leave. Let's take a moment to celebrate. And, you know, even if it was just a few months ago, that was such a big lesson for me. And I hope that when the day will come with my, uh, you know, uh, people on my team, I'm going to be able to be a manager who is there for them and help them to celebrate also the personal and, you know, those family achievements as well. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I wasn't fishing for congratulations. I'm sorry. I just, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm a really personal uh, uh, person, so I like to share personal stories. Uh, we are kind of over time, so just quick round of you know what is the biggest lesson that you learn over the year? I know something something easy, yeah, right? Do a quick round. Frankie, do you want to go first? Or was that to me? Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to go first because you sure. <laughs> I can jump into that. I was actually pulling up my notes there because I know I wrote something and want to double check. Um, so yeah, I think for me, <clears throat> sorry, really struggling with my voice here. Um, for me, I think the biggest kind of generalized lesson I've learned is iterating is key. Um, and maybe mm -hmm. this goes back to kind of skill sets, but I've kind of learned that like. And it goes back to what I said before, you don't want to just solve for the first problem that comes to mind. So going through and learning that, you know, 
start with option A that you've come up with as an idea why you're framing sketching, however you start, and then going through, you know, a couple of different versions and just constantly kind of working with your team. And that includes, you know, product managers, engineers, designers, anyone who's physically on your product team, you know, get as many disciplines involved as possible. I always think is better. Um, but being able to really um, just keep iterating and having that open communication is something that I've kind of learned from working as a solo consultant to joining, you know, larger design teams. Um, and it's something that I think has made me a stronger designer overall, just being able to kind of push my own kind of biases and boundaries from my design side. Mm -hmm. Nice. Who wants to go next? I'll go Frankie. Um, well, for me as a coach, stepping into a nuanced role um, and, and having a team and, and feeling a deep responsibility to my team um, to encourage them to step up and step in and to lead from behind. And I think it's very important to get to know each one of them um, and coach them into new challenges and into new roles and seeing my team uh, develop and grow brings genuine confidence and, and pleasure in what I'm doing with them. So, so that has been um, a great lesson and achievement, I feel, in my own career now. Um, for me, I would say standing up for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I think I mentioned before that I'm an introvert and so you know, throughout my career, I've been told to be more vocal and to speak up in meetings. But, you know, my personality is more to sit back, listen and process what I'm absorbing and then give you my opinion. But, you know, the culture is to just be loud and to state your opinion quickly. Um, and, you know, there was one instance where I was at an offsite with senior leadership and we were discussing how to nurture our employees and to retain clients, um, not retain clients, retain our um, talent. Yeah. And everyone was participating. And then the, you know, the big boss said, I've noticed there are three of you who are not speaking up and just know that if you don't talk, you're gonna be called upon. And I happen to be one of those three people and it just completely you know, annoyed me. <laughs> so, um, especially because here we were talking about nurturing our employees and the big boss was making us uncomfortable. Um, so I actually, the next day I went into his office and I gave him a copy of the book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts by Susan Cain. And I told him, I was like, listen, you called out three of us yesterday and it made us uncomfortable. And, you know, we work differently. And he read it. And he actually thanked me for it. He said, you know, thank you for opening my eyes. You know, I realize that everyone has to be treated differently. So, mm -hmm. you know, stand up for yourself. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, to just to, to circle back on what everyone said, it's about finding, you have to find your empowered voice, right? So you have mm -hmm. to find, your voice and your unique and authentic way of communicating your ideas. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because when I, when I look at candidates and I, and I talk, I interview candidates, there, there are two things that are probably the most critical for me. It is, what is your process for problem solving? So how are you going to understand the customer's need and the journey so that you can translate all these requirements and use cases and everything. How are you gonna process all that? Because anybody can show me a Figma design, but I need to know that you actually, you got from A to Z and how did you do that, right? And then the second piece is how are you going to integrate with my team? So if I need to be able, I need to be able to see your personality. I need to be able to see the, all of those soft skills, how you communicate, how you present yourself. Those are for me, you know, obviously you have to be able to use the tools and all that, but those two things are very, very critical. Um, so just, you know, keeping those in mind as you kind of go out in the world and, and are interviewing and talking to, to clients for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone. This was wonderful. I will let you know go on for another hour. <laughs> uh, but 
Uh, I'm Sim, uh, Emma here. So I want to thank again, like all of you. Thank you for sharing your stories with me and the rest of the audience. Thank you to the audience who ask a tons of questions. Uh, I'm going to check with Emma, how can we answer maybe mm -hmm. some of those uh, later as well. Um, it was fantastic. Uh, but Emma, mm -hmm. I leave the stage to you now. Yeah, thank you so much. I know we went a few minutes over, but we just could not cut the conversation short. It was too good and we could definitely go for another hour. Thank you to all of you who joined all our wonderful panelists for speaking and Manuela for moderating for us um, and for just everyone who popped in to attend. So I saw a lot in the chat about wanting to continue the conversation and get a community going. So definitely Stay tuned for our follow-up on that. We do have something in the works, a way for everyone to be able to connect um, and continue to build upon this wonderful networking community that we've seen today um, during this event. So thank you again for everyone who's been involved. This has been incredible. Um, and again, stay tuned and we will be in touch. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye everyone.